Hello and welcome to this online training session hosted by Paramedical Services, a recognized training organization with nationally recognized and accredited courses by ASQA. This online training session will be encompassing all the trauma and environmental emergencies in HLT AID 003 Provide First Aid and HLT AID 004 Provide an Emergency First Aid Response in an Education and Care Setting. The overview of this online training session will include trauma injuries such as wounds and bleeding, shock, burns, poisoning and envenomation, injuries to the head, neck and face, fractures, sprains and strains, and how to apply slings and bandages. Starting off with wounds and bleeding. A wound is any abnormal break in the skin or other tissues which allow blood to escape from the body. Wounds can be very minor, such as the abrasion shown in the picture on the right hand side over here, which would result in minimal blood loss, whereas the wound in the left hand side of the picture over here, there's a deep laceration and even possibly an avulsion of the tissue there. This probably would have had quite a lot or significant bleeding and this person is more at risk of going into shock from blood loss than the person on the right. However, any wound or break in the skin can be dangerous because there is now opening for infectious substances to enter the body. To aim in stopping infection from spreading through the body and causing delayed wound healing, we're going to learn about some basic wound care and infection control. The first thing to do when managing a wound is always protecting yourself from any blood products. So make sure that you put on a pair of gloves. Place a towel or absorbent towel under the wound so that you minimize the amount of blood spreading on any other surfaces. Wet a gauze pad from your first aid kit with some saline or some water and gently clean the wound. Start at the center of the wound and start cleaning round in circles outwards. We never want to wipe things into the wound, so always make sure we clean from the center out, not from out to the center. This helps to prevent the spread of infection. Once the wound is nice and clean and removed any debris from the area, take a dry gauze and just pat the wound dry, then cover with a clean or a sterile dressing. Remember to dispose of the waste appropriately and wash your hands thoroughly, even though you have been wearing a pair of gloves. Bleeding is classified by the type of blood vessels that are damaged. You can get arterial bleeds, venous bleeds and capillary bleeds. An arterial bleed is quite easy to see because blood spurts out and it usually pulsates along with the heartbeat. And because arteries are coming straight from the heart, they're under very high pressure. So somebody can lose blood very quickly from arterial bleeds, which can result in shock. Venous bleeds, on the other hand, gush profusely, but they do not pulsate like it does in an arterial bleed. So they're a little bit more easy to control. However, there is still significant blood loss that can happen from venous bleeds, which can lead to shock. Capillary bleeds are one of the most minor bleeds that you can get. These usually happen with abrasion type wounds that we saw on the first page of wounds. And blood usually slowly oozes out of the site, but dries very quickly and clots and forms a scab rather rapidly. So the chance of having significant blood loss from a capillary bleed is very low. In order to control bleeding so that the person does not go into shock, there's a few basic steps that we can do. We use a mnemonic called DICE. DICE is something that we use to help us to remember how to control bleeding properly. The first thing to do is put direct pressure on the wound. When you compress the blood vessels in the area, it slows the blood moving through that area and it helps clots to form nice and quickly and stops the blood loss. Putting ice or a cold pack on the area helps to constrict the blood vessels, decreasing the amount of blood loss and helping that wound clot properly. Apply a compression bandage. You will be shown how to do this in your face-to-face -face training and have ample time to practice. Using a compression bandage over the area also compresses the blood vessels near the surface of the skin. This makes blood move slower through the area and help the blood to clot. Elevation helps by preventing too much blood flowing up a limb or up an area because of the force of gravity on it. 
This again helps to reduce the amount of blood loss and helps clotting to occur a lot faster. And this is the type of roller bandage that you can use or a compression bandage that will help stop bleeding and minimize swelling when you do your compression dressings. You will have the opportunity to practice using these in your case scenarios during your practical training. This is another style of dressing and bandages that you may find in your first aid box. It's usually labeled dressing number 13 or dressing number 15. And the only difference between this and a roller bandage is that this bandage actually comes prepped with a trauma pad attached to it. This makes it easy because then you don't have to open two packages when you're applying a pressure dressing onto a wound. So as you can see in the diagram, once it's opened up, you apply the pad onto the wound site and then roll the bandage onto the affected area and tie it off. When dealing with any type of embedded object, never remove it from the person, as this can cause more damage and more bleeding. The best thing to do in this scenario is to apply pads and bandages around the area to support the embedded object so that it is stable and it doesn't get knocked out of the person. You can make use of a donut bandage in this situation to provide stability around the embedded object or depending on what it is, you might just need to pack roller bandages around the area to keep it nice and stable. In regards to nosebleeds, sit the patient down and place their head forward to avoid blood flowing down the back of their throat. Have them pinch the soft part of their nose as indicated in the diagram above. And if it's a hot day, place ice packs on the back of the neck or the bridge of the nose to cool the blood and slow down the bleeding. If the bleeding is controlled after 10 minutes, ask the patient not to blow their nose for several hours. If not controlled after 10 minutes, reapply the above management for a further 10 minutes. If bleeding is longer than 20 minutes in total, ensure that the patient seeks medical assistance. If dealing with a patient who has an amputated part, so whether this be an amputated finger, hand, foot or a limb, the priority is to first stop the bleeding on the person. Amputations can cause rapid blood loss and can lead to severe shock. So it's very important not to get concerned about the limb laying on the floor or the finger on the floor, but rather focus on the patient. Use the principles of DICE, so direct pressure, ice, compression bandage and elevation to stop the bleeding on the person first. Once the bleeding is controlled, you can locate the amputated part place it into a plastic bag and then on a thin piece of material and on ice. The reason that we want to have some material between the amputated part in the plastic bag and the ice is because when any tissue is put directly on ice, this can cause severe damage to the tissue and it might be very difficult then for the surgeons to reattach in hospital. So it's very important that we look after that amputated part correctly. And just to make a note here, Remove any jewelry from the amputated area or any limb that is injured because swelling can happen very rapidly and things like rings can get stuck on fingers or watches or bracelets can get stuck on arms and then they need to be cut off in hospital later. The sooner we can get jewelry removed from the limb, the better. I've mentioned the word shock several times already on this lecture. Shock is a word that has been misused in the past. A lot of people think that shock has to do with emotional or a mental state when somebody has got a terrible fright from an incident. The word shock in medical terms means that there's a lack of effective circulating blood volume. So that means that there's not enough blood in the body to provide the body with oxygen and nutrients that it needs for all the tissues and cells to survive. Bleeding is one of the most common causes of shock along with burns and dehydration. The signs and symptoms of shock include cold, pale, sweaty skin, a rapid or a weak pulse, rapid shallow breathing, thirst, drowsiness, which may also lead to unconsciousness. The treatment of shock is to conduct our DRS ABCD assessment, so checking for dangers, response, sending for help, airway, breathing, circulation, and assessing for any deformities or bleeding. Control the bleeding immediately using our DICE, direct pressure, ice, 
compression bandage and elevation. Lay the patient flat on the ground and slightly elevate their legs. We do this because there's quite a big amount of blood volume in the legs and if we lay a person down and elevate their legs that blood volume moves up towards the chest and it improves the blood flow to the heart and the vital organs. The next thing to do is keep the patient warm. So place a blanket over the patient or one of the rescue thermal blankets as you see in the picture on the right hand side. Burns have three different classifications depending on how deep the burn is through the skin. The first type of burn is called a superficial burn or a first degree burn. The second is a partial thickness burn or a second degree burn and you can see here that in the second degree burn that's when the water blisters are formed on the skin. The third type of burn is the third degree burn or full thickness burn. This is a burn that goes right through the top layers of the skin and that can go right through the fat tissues, down through the muscle and even down onto the bone. Burns can be caused by thermal energy such as from hot steam, oil or hot water, dry hot surfaces such as touching an iron or a stove or even a sunburn. Burns can be caused by different chemicals. The burns on this person's hand here was caused by a chemical burn. Acid burns and alkaline burns can be equally bad. It just depends on whether it's a strong acid or a weak acid or a strong alkaline or a weak alkaline. So both strong acids and strong alkalines can cause severe burns to the skin. Electrical burns can occur from being shot from electricity. And you can get friction burns where somebody has had some road rash from falling off their bicycle. Inhalation burns are usually a result from being caught in house fires or bushfires. This is when somebody may breathe in those superheated gases and the smoke from the fire and that can actually burn the delicate airways inside the nose and mouth and the lungs. The treatment for burns is to do our DRS ABCD assessment. The principles are to cool, cover and carry. So ensure that you place the burnt area under cool running water for 20 minutes avoiding hypothermia. Do not use ice because ice can actually cause more damage to the skin than good. And for chemical burns, we want to wash them for about 30 minutes, so longer than that of any other burn. The reason being why is we need to make sure all the chemical that is causing the irritation to the skin is effectively diluted and washed away. Cover the burn with a clean cotton sheet, or you may have some burn dressings in your first aid kit. The reason we need to cover the burn is just like any wound, the skin is now open to different bacteria and viruses, and it could become infected. If burns become infected, they take a very long time to heal and can cause terrible scarring. So we want to make sure that we protect the patient by covering up those burns. And the next point is to carry. So move the patient off to hospital as rapidly as possible. We have a number of products in our households or workplaces that could be very poisonous to us if ingested. A poison is a substance that is harmful to the body when it enters into the body. Poisons enter the body by being swallowed, inhaled, injected or absorbed through the skin. Signs and symptoms of poisoning will depend on what substance someone has either ingested, injected or been absorbed through the skin. Acids and corrosives will cause swelling of the airway, difficulty breathing, burning to the mouth, nose and windpipe and stomach cramping or vomiting. The treatment for any poisoning is to do our DRS ABCD and call for the ambulance immediately. Attempt to identify the poison from bystanders and what type and what quantity of the substance was involved. We want to try and figure out was the poison corrosive or non-corrosive. Rest and reassure the patient, monitor the person's airway and breathing and then contact the Poison Information Centre on 13 11 26 for advice. If the patient has ingested a corrosive substance, give small sips of water, but do not induce vomiting, as this could cause compromise to the person's airway and could worsen their condition. Australia has some of the most deadliest snakes in the world. These include taipans, brown snakes, tiger snakes and black snakes. Funnelweb spider bites have similar venom to that of the dangerous snakes. The venom travels quickly through the body and it's why we treat it the same. 
Signs and symptoms can include anything from fang marks or puncture marks. There may be one or sometimes it can just look like a scratch on the person's leg or arm. The person may experience headaches, nausea and vomiting, abdominal or chest pain, breathing difficulties, continued bleeding from the site of the bite. These snakes and the funnel web spider are highly dangerous because what they will ultimately result in is respiratory arrest which can lead to cardiac arrest if they do not get the appropriate care. And if children ever say that they've been bitten by a snake or a spider, believe them. When treating a snake or funnel web spider bite, conduct your DRS ABCD assessment. Rest calm and reassure the patient. Do not walk the patient, do not apply a tourniquet and do not wash the area. We do not walk the patient as muscle movement helps lymphatic flow through the body. Snake bite venom travels through the lymphatic system in the body and not the bloodstream and that's why we do not apply a tourniquet to the patient either. We do not wash the area as when the patient is admitted into hospital, the doctors can swab the area to find out what type of venom this person has been infected with which can help them in their treatment and using the correct anti-venom. When applying a pressure bandage, Take the wrapper from the bandage and place it over the bite site. This also helps to preserve the venom on the skin so that they can swap it in hospital and identify it easily. Then apply a pressure bandage over the bite site. Mark an X on the bandage to show where the bite site is for easy access. Then using a broad compression bandage, bandage from the patient's fingers or toes from the bottom of the limb up to the top to immobilize the limb. Monitor the airway and breathing very closely in these patients as they are at risk of going into respiratory arrest. The next section we're going to go through is head injuries, facial injuries and neck and spinal injuries. So starting with head injuries, this can include any injury to the head or the skull or the face. It can be caused by blunt or penetrating trauma. And it can include anything from a mild concussion to a severe traumatic brain injuries. The signs and symptoms vary from altered level of consciousness, headache, nausea or vomiting, blurred vision, confusion or disorientation, and any swelling, bruising or bleeding at the site of injury. If there's any bleeding or fluid from the nose, this is a very bad sign of a traumatic brain injury and these patients require medical assistance immediately. Treatment for any head injury is to conduct a DRS ABCD assessment and call for an ambulance straight away. Do not move the patient because there may be an injury to the spine as well. Calm and reassure the patient. Test the patient's memory by asking questions like, what is your name, where are you and what day is it? Do not give any medication or fluids to the person. If the patient is unconscious, roll them into the Haynes position. This position protects the spine in the event of a spinal injury, but also helps to keep the airway open and clear. And keep in mind that if there's a head injury, there's the possibility of a spinal injury. Spinal injuries can be caused by sporting injuries, workplace injuries, and motor vehicle accidents. It can be caused by either damaging the vertebrae that protect the spine, or by damaging the nerve tissue itself in the spine. When assessing the signs and symptoms of a person with a spinal injury, if they are conscious, ask questions about the history of the event. This can give you lots of telltale signs of whether or not this could be a spinal injury. If the patient has any pain in the neck or the back, pins and needles feeling or electric shock or any funny feelings in their body, this could be a sign of, of a spinal injury. Ask the patient, can they move their arms? Can they move their legs? Can they form a fist? Can they move their wrists up and down? Can they bend their knees and can they push their feet up and down? These are all tests just to check that all the nerves are working in the body and all the right signals are getting sent from the spine. If the person has any abnormalities in this, they could have a spinal injury. The treatment and management for a spinal injury is to conduct our DRS ABCD assessment, call for an ambulance, prevent any movement of the neck, head or spine, calm and reassure the patient and support the head and neck by giving manual immobilization. 
This means that we can have the patient laying flat on their back and we can place our hands on either side of their head to stop them from moving their head left or right. Do not attempt to realign the head or the neck though if it's in a strange position. And if the patient is unconscious, remember we can use the Haynes position to protect the neck and the spine and this keeps the patient's airway open and clear. Continuing on with facial injuries, eye injuries can be a significant injury to a person. We rely so much on our sight to do the jobs that we do every day that it's so important that if anybody has an eye injury that we treat it appropriately. In the event of any penetrating injury to the eye, do not remove the object, just like we do with any other penetrating injury. Never remove it from the person. But make sure that you support it appropriately with a donut bandage or other roller bandages to support the object. Cover both eyes in any event of a penetrating eye injury. We do this because if one eye starts to move around to look at things, the other eye will follow it too, and this can worsen the injury to the eyes. So we need to make sure that both eyes are covered over so that there's no movement. In saying that, you can imagine as a patient, that would be quite a scary thing to not only have an eye injury, but also to not be able to see what's going on around you. So make sure that when you do cover both the person's eyes, that you are constantly informing them about what's happening around them and their environment and who might be approaching them so it doesn't give them too much of a fright. In the event of a foreign object in the eye, such as dust, sand, bits of metal, or any other foreign object, Gently examine the eye and flush the eye with saline or tap water. If this is unsuccessful, lightly pad both eyes and rest the casualty and call for medical attention. In the event of a chemical burn to the eye, irrigate the eye with cold tap water, holding the eyelids open for at least 30 minutes. If unsuccessful, lightly pad both eyes, rest the casualty and seek medical attention. Ascertain the type of chemical and whether it was a liquid or a powder for handover to the emergency services. Abdominal injuries is any injury to the abdominal region that can be caused from car accidents, sporting injuries, crushed by a heavy weight or blunt or penetrating trauma to the abdomen. This could cause severe internal bleeding which could lead to shock. Signs of symptoms of abdominal injury can include pain at the site of injury, nausea or vomiting, distension or rigidity of the abdomen, or any signs or symptoms of shock. Treatment for abdominal injuries include assessing your DRS, ABCD, calling for help, and then position the patient in a comfortable position. This can be done by laying the patient back with their head and shoulders slightly raised off the ground and then slightly bend their knees towards their chest. Mimicking the fetal position. This takes pressure off the abdomen and makes it more comfortable for the patient. Loosen any clothing around the abdomen that may be restricting it, then keep the patient warm and monitor them until the ambulance arrives. Crush injuries can occur from a multitude of different accidents. This can be a result of something falling onto a person or a person getting pinned against a wall by some type of machinery and it's very important that any crushing force that is on a person should be removed immediately after the accident. If there's a delay in releasing the crushing force, a condition called crush syndrome can develop. This is a life-threatening injury which can cause multiple organ failure and the release will then need to be assisted with medication from paramedics on site. Musculoskeletal injuries can include different types of injuries such as fractures, dislocations, sprains and strains. A fracture is any break in the continuity of a bone. You get different types of fractures. Fractures can either be open or closed, described in the picture here. Open meaning when the bone protrudes through the skin and there's bleeding at the site. Or you can have a closed fracture where the bone does not poke through the skin but there may be bleeding internally. Then we can get what's called a complicated fracture. A complicated fracture is when there's an association with an injury of an important structure such as the brain, blood vessels, the heart, the lungs or the liver. Signs and symptoms of a fracture include pain, bruising, deformity, you may see bones sticking out of the skin, a reduction in movement or force, 
So often when people say, if you can move it, it's not broken, that's not necessarily true. Often people can move the injured limb to a degree, but it may just be reduced amount of force or a reduced amount of movement. You may hear the sound crepitus, which is the sound of bone grinding of bone when the person tries to move the injured limb. And there may be the presence of swelling. To treat a fracture, the most important thing is to immobilize it. The sooner you immobilize the area, the sooner this reduces the amount of pain this person experiences. The next thing we would like to do is apply a splint onto the area. And depending on what part of the body it is, there are many different types of splints that you can use. As long as the object is long enough, wide enough and strong enough to support the bone, it can be used as a splint. The next is to get the patient in a position of comfort. Sprains and strains are other musculoskeletal injuries which somebody can get. This can get caused by either ripping or tearing of muscles, tendons or ligaments. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell which is a strain or a sprain, but we treat them the same. In the treatment of a strain or a sprain, we use the mnemonic RICE. R stands for rest. I stands for ice. So we can apply ice or a cold pack to the injury for about 20 minutes reassess the injury and then we can continue applying ice at 20 minute intervals to help reduce the swelling. C is for compression, so apply a nice compression bandage because this can help to reduce the swelling and to provide some immobilization to the injury. Then E is for elevation. Elevating an injury such as a strain or a sprain can be very helpful to reduce the pain as it limits the amount of inflammation and swelling that takes place. If you are unsure whether something is a strain, a sprain or a fracture, always treat it as though it's the worst case scenario and treat it like a fracture. Dislocations can occur mainly from things like sporting injuries, accidents or falls, which result in the displacement of the bones from their normal position in the joint. The signs and symptoms can include severe pain, deformity of the joint and a reduction of movement or a reduction in the force of the limb. The management for a dislocation is to immobilize the affected limb with an appropriate sling and then send the patient to hospital for further management. Here are some of the different types of slings that can be used for specific injuries. This is the hospital sling. The hospital sling is very helpful for immobilizing fractures of the hand, the wrist, the forearm or the elbow. The elevation sling is used to support either a fractured clavicle or collarbone or dislocated shoulder. And collar and cuff slings can be used for upper arm fractures and for any instance that you would like to cause elevation of the hand or the wrist. During your face-to-face -face training session, you will be shown the different types of slings and bandaging methods and you will have ample time to practice this in different case scenarios. This concludes our online lecture on trauma emergencies. Thank you for joining us for this online training session. Here are some other available courses hosted by paramedical services.